In the Middle Eastern story of the Tower of Babel, humanity worked together to build a great tower reaching up to the heavens. God came to earth and seeing that unified in language and labor, they could achieve anything and scattered people and confused their languages. The story of Babel resonates as myth across cultures and time. It is a story of diversity and difference emerging from common evolutionary forebears and tyranny. It is a story of human hubris, power, and a fall from grace. Bruegel, in the 14th century, used it as a critique of the Roman Empire, as seen in this Colosseum-like image he painted. Photographer Julie Holcomb has revisited the myth, reformulating it as a story of great technological and engineering achievements of the modern age, and it is to this version that I would like to speak. Let us suppose for a moment that this tower is depicted by Robert Gonzalves in his painting, The Library. This is a tower of knowledge, which is the scaffolding at the core of Julie Holcomb's vision. The origins and purposes of this tower of modern, normal science were laid out in the 17th century by René Descartes. Beginning with what we know for sure, I think, therefore I am, taking nothing for granted, he imagined that we humans could render ourselves the lords and possessors of nature. This, he said, is to be desired especially for the preservation of health, which is the first and fundamental blessing of life. Descartes' approach to knowledge, based on doubt and an absolute faith in reason and logic, changed everything. In the centuries that followed, great scholars from Darwin and Newton and Galileo and Einstein led the Herculean effort to combine observation and logic to create a new vision of who we are on this planet and what our place is in the universe. Consider briefly how science has changed health, that first and fundamental blessing. There are many definitions of health, from the World Health Organization's declaration that it is an orgasmic state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Of course, they didn't use the word orgasmic, but if, if you look at the definition, that's kind of what they're saying. To microbiologist René Dubot's more modest claim that it is a modus vivendi enabling imperfect people to achieve a rewarding and not too painful existence while they cope with an imperfect world. Whatever the definition, health, in my view, comes down to just three things. And it's not just my three grandchildren, which you see here, but three things, and they all start with F, and that's probably not what first comes to your mind. Health is, first of all, food. Henry IV of France articulated this vision of health a few years before Descartes made it possible, when he said that, if God keeps me, I will make sure that no peasant in my realm will lack the means to have a chicken in the pot on Sunday. He was assassinated by a fanatic Catholic a few years later, so it, his vision took a little bit longer to achieve, but nevertheless, it was achieved. We have achieved cornucopias of food beyond the wildest dreams of even the maddest kings and scientists. We not only can put a chicken in every peasant's pot once a week, we can pretty much drop one in the pot almost every week, peasant or not. There are about 19 billion chickens on the planet, about a billion pigs, slightly more than a billion cows. The second F of health is freedom from disease. How well have we done with this? Almost all the major infectious diseases that have devastated humanity over the millennia, from cholera and the Black Death to typhoid fever and smallpox, have been pushed back, some like smallpox, to extinction. Again, these downward sloping disease graphs look like success to me. Between our success at producing food and controlling disease, we can now keep more people alive for longer and feed them more chicken than ever before in the history of the planet. But by the late 20th century, we started seeing surprises. Robert Gonzalez's painting of the house by the railroad might just as well have been called the scientist in the laboratory. From foodborne infections and avian influenza across the top of this slide to asthma and diabetes across the bottom, new diseases have been emerging where the old ones have disappeared, and the old diseases are coming back, some resistant to the most powerful drugs we have available. And you know all that food we produce? Probably the best 
integrative measure of global food production is excrement. Since it integrates not just increasing numbers of people and animals, but also the crops that feed us all. We and our animals produce more than 14 billion tons of excrement on this planet every year. That's another face of our success. In the late 20th century, scientists were increasingly faced with what we call wicked problems. That is, those in which solving one part of the problem makes several other parts of the problem or several other problems worse. The unintended consequences of our grand successes include emerging diseases, environmental collapse, climate change, and social turbulence. And OMG, everything is happening at once. Our response? Where Descartes once dreamed of a common scientific tower enabled by a common scientific language crossing culture and time, we have built not a great tower, but many more smaller towers and created many more languages. Today, there are four times as many scholarly journals, over 24,000, each with its own culture and language, as there are historically based human languages, an estimate of six to 7,000, depending on how you measure them. Just as we thought we had found a common language, DNA perhaps, or mathematics, or physics, we have confused and scattered ourselves across the world. This is where I get to the third F in health. Friends. Bruegel, in his painting, The Village Wedding Feast, pretty much said it all. Eating is not just about food, it's about connections, relationships, conversations. In 1848, biomedical scientist Rudolf Virchow was sent to a depressed Prussian province in Upper Silesia to investigate a typhus epidemic. The responses he proposed were not vaccination, were not public health projects. They were full employment, higher wages, the establishment of agricultural cooperatives, universal education, and a requirement that professionals such as teachers and physicians speak the language of the local people. He also recommended that they disestablish the Catholic Church, but that was problematic at the time. In 2005, the World Health Organization summarized more than a century of evidence for what they called the social determinants of health. Their conclusions were essentially the same as those of virtual. Yet somehow scientists have been unable to make any headway to understand and grapple with this fundamental aspect of health. Why? Because the notion of friends is based on connection and conversation, interchange among living things. And the science we know is mostly based on knowing stuff, not on understanding relationships. Like Virchow, I had my Upper Silesia experience. Mine was in Nepal in the 1990s. I went to study a dog tapeworm that causes tumor-like cysts in people. After we had gathered detailed scientific information over several years, from the DNA of the worm to the infection rates in dogs and people and buffalo, we published reports, we talked to government officials, we ran public education programs, and nothing changed. What we discovered, based on that work and work in Canada, Kenya, Uganda, Peru, Argentina, and Southeast Asia, was that we were missing something fundamental. Using normal science, we could study all of the things, but those things only mattered because of the relationships among them and the values people placed on them. Those relationships mediated through forces of culture, chemicals, gravity, vocalizations, food webs, are what holds societies, ecosystems, and the universe together. They are what determined the health of wards 19 and 20 in Kathmandu. Biodiversity and health and food and disease aren't mostly about stuff. They are about the relationships and the values we place on them. Dogs are companions, bite threats, environmental contaminators, disease spreaders, therapists, temple guards, shepherds, and seeing eye guides. Cattle are for racing, for fighting, for food, transportation, for excrement. Excrement is contamination, disease, energy, food, building material, fertilizer. We worked together with the people in Nepal where they lived after that, struggling with them to understand the complex conversations and natural relationships that made their world what it was. Once we did this, everything changed and they began to create the world they wanted, not the world they had. And those pictures on the right are exactly the same places as those on the left, and it wasn't a whole pile of money that came in. 
They simply began to reimagine the place where they lived, and they put different values on different things. Normal science has succeeded so far by studying in exquisite detail the conversance in the universe. Quarks, bosons, atoms, rabbits, liver cells, rocks, elephants, oak trees, children, old men, couches, books. It is based on a premise that there is one correct view, one global story that trumps everyone else's. It is a story about things. Yet the world speaks to us not in one voice, but in the shape-shifting aurora borealis-like languages of opas and grandchildren, tales of adventure, gravity, electricity, radiation, genetics and epigenetics, the subtle tongues of pheromones and immune-modulating biochemicals with which the bacteria in our guts speak to us and the trees speak to the microbes around them, the cries of whales and diving falcons and the curmudgeonly growls of bears. What do we understand of the trillions of conversations among bacteria, viruses, living and dead matter? We can describe them in crude ways, enough to bully nature into short-term submission through environmental management and public health projects, but we cannot grasp them sufficiently to understand the stories they tell or engage in real conversation. The biblical narrative of the Pentecost is a kind of Tower of Babel in reverse. Inspirational flames came down from the heavens so that people understood each other, even as they continued to speak their multiple languages. Science today needs a similar inspiration. What we need now more than ever is a science rooted in conversations that can reimagine the world in different ways, a science that admits multiple perspectives, that listens and responds to multiple voices. Can we do this? Reimagine our science, reimagine who we are, find stories as complex and real as life, worthy of the hopes of our grandchildren? The languages are all around us. And if we only pay attention, listen, and engage, we can begin to understand and to rediscover ourselves in this amazing planet. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. Mm -hmm. Do I go to a blank slide here? Sorry. And I want you to think about, imagine your whole life, right back to the time you were born, the whole, the whole life, and that of your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. Go all the way back to when the first animals crawled out of the water and came on to land. You are a product of all of those millions and billions of species that have ever lived. They are now part of you. They're speaking in you. Can you hear them? Can you listen to them? Can you pass their stories on to the next generation? We did not know to what we were committed when we stood up that day. The rush to dance, airs to the earth, like fish lifting from muck on wings, that feeling of how good it was, what we had, the rush into the bronchioles, flushed with the burst of pent-up possibilities of what a chance we have. Reeling in air, we swaggered and bred, put on airs, strutting our songs, soaring on waf wafts of gnosis among the clouds, and then the blur of birth and nesting, seeking after food, doing good, writing and writing wrongs, a lifetime of being primates, a little lower than the angels at home on earth. But for a moment now, let us pause in mid-stride on this wintry day, amazed at what we've wrought, to what we have committed, our fire transformed, made real, a place of woods and streams, small animals and children, where grace in flight sings songs of air and flight and air and flight again, our fears airborne by alchemies of love, our certainties upturned by drafts, the only cure for life, our friends, still swooping synchronously into the falling evening air. Thank you.